I hope you've all had a nice rest. Some of you still are doing flat out meditation. <laughs> so I hope that's uh, good for your body, good for your mind. And uh, this afternoon, again, it's optional. Um, but I wanted to talk about the Anapanasati Sutta, so the Buddha's own teaching on breath meditation, um, using one of the translations from my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. And we're not going to get through the whole thing because that would be just reading stages after stages. And that's not really the way the practice works. Rather than a prescription, it's more of a description of what actually happens naturally as long as we set the right causes in place and we set the process in place. The length of time that takes is completely beyond our control. But we can focus, as always, on having this right attitude establishing mindfulness properly and skillfully at the beginning. And that's one big thing that often is missed out from the teachings on Anapanasati Sutta, as we shall see. So I just wanted to give a very brief history to why this sutta was actually given, um, bearing in mind that breath meditation was the Buddha's own preferred method and the one that he actually used under the Bodhi tree to get enlightened. Um, but the reason it came about was that before that, um, there was a group of monks and I think they were just monks. So let them have it this time because normally, <laughs> normally in the suttas it addresses monks, but it includes monks and nuns. It's just not made explicit, but this time it makes monks clear. So anyway, I'm not sure if nuns would do this. <laughs> I'm kind of joking. Um, I'm not meaning to be sexist, but. Uh, basically, the monks were given some asubha contemplation, which means to contemplate the repulsive nature of the body. So to contemplate that the body is subject to death, to decay. And, you know, the, the body, the Buddha uses strong language like it's a dart, it's a boil, it's an affliction. But the purpose of doing that kind of contemplation is usually to overcome uh, lust especially if people have a lot of loss towards the opposite gender or the same gender in the celibate monastic life. But these monks unfortunately took it a little bit too far and inclined their mind so strongly towards the disgusting nature of the body that they became really um, averse to their bodies and they actually started committing suicide. <laughs> so it was a really huge disaster and the Buddha came back to his Sangha, to his group of monks and nuns and he said, why? Venerable Ananda, his attendant, why is this Sangha so diminished? What happened here? And then his attendant told him that unfortunately these monks had taken the teaching in the wrong way and they you know, developed so much disgust and repulsion towards their body that they couldn't stand it anymore. So obviously the Buddha was uh, pretty concerned about that and decided instead to teach the remaining people the Anapana Sati Sutta. So I think it's interesting to notice that contrast between the meditation that leads to unwholesome states of mind. And obviously in that case, they misused it, they misunderstood it, and it led to practices that are not the middle way, so the extreme of self-harm. But Anapana was given as a remedy for that because Anapana meditation, meditation along with the breath, is supposed to be a pleasant abiding. It's supposed to be a calm and um, peaceful meditation. So it's not supposed to be difficult to be hard, to be kind of unpleasant and uncomfortable. It's actually supposed to lead to these pleasant states of mind called the jhanas. And even pre-jhana, there can be a lot of happiness there, just from simplifying the mind on something, you know, as simple um, and humble and natural as the breath. So, obviously, Anapana also has uh, qualities of overcoming the hindrances. So, in the same way as metta meditation helps overcome the hindrances to meditation, particularly ill will, so does breath meditation. And we can almost see the entire Buddhist practice as aimed at removing these hindrances that obscure the mind and prevent us from experiencing that inner peace and happiness and having the strong, powerful mind that can penetrate the true nature of things. So Anapana is also very uh, skillful, very effective in helping us overcome thought. 
So as I said earlier, we were already um, working with skillful thought to overcome some of the unwholesome thought. But then once those coarser habit patterns are removed, we can use the Anapana meditation to remove the last traces of thought. Because again, if we go to the breath too soon, and the Buddha specified if the mind is obsessed with thoughts, it's just too difficult to practice. And the mind just repeatedly bounces off the breath. So we're moving into gradual refinement. And of course, you don't have to practice metta before the breath, but I have found it incredibly helpful. And it also fulfills that aspect of right effort, which precedes mindfulness and samadhi. So the Buddha prescribed the Anapana for overcoming thought, but also for leading all the way to Nibbana. As I said, he practiced this himself under the Bodhi tree. And uh, not only that, but it also fulfills the four Satipatthanas. I don't know how many people here know the four Satipatthanas. Hopefully everyone. Hopefully. No? <laughs> so these are the four foundations of mindfulness, or you could call it the four um, focuses of mindfulness. So the four areas of our experience which we should direct our mindfulness to. So with mindfulness, we're not just being mindful of whatever's in front of us. I mean, in the meditation, of course, that's where we begin. But you can be mindful of pointing a gun at somebody. <laughs> you know, you can be mindful of shouting at somebody, but this isn't right mindfulness. So right mindfulness is using our awareness, using our mindfulness to direct it in areas that we can uncover this delusion of a self, basically. So those four areas are the areas of the body, because obviously most people identify very strongly with this physical form. The area of feeling, often related to the body, but it also means uh, emotions, feelings in the mind. And then the area of the mind itself, whether the mind is expansive or contracted, whether it's peaceful or agitated, qualities of the mind. And lastly, the qualities of the mental content which means things like the Four Noble Truths, suffering, the cause of suffering, the way out of suffering, in other words, the, the remedy, if you like, the medicine, and then the path. So in brief, they're the four areas that we tend to trip up on and get stuck and take to be a self, especially sometimes our thoughts, our perceptions, our views, maybe even consciousness itself, right? Many people say, ah, oh, the body is not self, but consciousness is who I really am. And that's, you know, perhaps a stage on the path where you start to identify more with the subtleness of the mind. But the Buddha was saying that all of this, this whole field of experience is impermanent and not self. Suffering, of course, and not self. The suffering is an interesting one, not to get too sidetracked, but it doesn't mean you have to initially experience it as suffering or that seeing these things as suffering makes one suffer. It's actually quite the opposite because it's almost as though we're gradually refining our sense of what happiness really is. So when you first come to meditation, you might think happiness is just being away from home. You know, <laughs> you don't have to do your work and that's already happiness. But later on, when you get more peaceful, you realize, oh, that was still agitated. Now I feel much more peaceful and, and the bliss is becoming pure. So you're not kind of condemning the previous happiness. You're just getting a taste for more refined happinesses as you practice the path. And so gradually we give up the coarser to move towards the more pure, refined, and also trustworthy and lasting happinesses that can come from the mind. So basically practicing breath meditation, the Buddha says, completes the four foundations of mindfulness. In other words, it is a complete practice in and of itself. So here, this is from the Majjhima Nikaya, let's have a look, 118. So this is the Anapana Sati Sutta with a, a lot of description of breath meditation. So the Buddha says, when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it's of great fruit and great benefit. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it completes the four focuses of mindfulness. When the four focuses of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they complete the seven enlightenment factors. 
In other words, all the ingredients you need for liberation. And when the seven enlightenment factors are developed and cultivated, they complete true knowledge and deliverance, enlightenment itself. So, we're going to go into the sutta a little bit and start with the beginnings of establishing mindfulness. And this also comes in the tetrad on mindfulness of the body. So here the Buddha says, you go to a quiet, secluded place like Sheffield Insight, <laughs> the Quaker Center, or the basement. Sit down comfortably and give priority to establishing mindfulness. How do you say that? Parimukkam satim upattapetwa. And this in Pali means something like, sometimes it's translated as establish mindfulness in front of you. Parimukkam means kind of like at the front. And some people even translate it as around the mouth. And then they interpret that to mean by the nostrils, which is a valid interpretation in some way. But quite a life-changing interpretation of this for me has been to give mindfulness priority because to establish something in front of one also means we establish it as a priority, we establish it first. And here in the sutta, the Buddha is saying that we should have a degree of mindfulness before we go to the breath. Okay. So this is very important and one of the main reasons why breath meditation doesn't work fairly often because we haven't done the preliminaries of establishing a sense of mindfulness first of all. So one of the reasons that um, I wanted to teach the metta first and also kindfulness was to get that preliminary mindfulness and to brighten up the mind a bit with qualities like joy and um, energy because energy comes from joy so that we'd have enough mindfulness to then place onto the breath, or if you like, to then receive the breath. Okay, so we establish mindfulness first of all. And it has to be the right kind of mindfulness. Yeah, As I said, you can be mindful of anything, but we need to understand what mindfulness is in the Buddhist context, which means the mindfulness that is free as far as possible from the hindrances, the mindfulness that is in the present moment. So present moment awareness is a, a kind of mindfulness. And again, mindfulness directed to the body initially, and then to the breath, to the mind, the qualities in the mind, and to the Dhamma as well. And another aspect of mindfulness that's often overlooked is the aspect of mindfulness as a gatekeeper, which means that there's a kind of guard on your mind. So it's a certain mindfulness that notices what is an unwholesome or a wholesome thought and tries to keep out the unwholesome and replace it with the wholesome, for example. Or that understands the qualities to be developed and the qualities to be abandoned and not followed. So mindfulness has this discernment with it. And again, you know, we want to move into being more passive. We don't want to be overly active in our meditation, which is why we cultivate wholesome qualities in the mind, first of all. So they're more likely to arise. And the mindfulness can then be aware of what it needs to be aware of, rather than all these hindrances that pull you away from the present moment. So we're establishing mindfulness as a priority. And you might feel the breath when it comes into the body in a certain area of the body. But in order for deepening samadhi, deepening our practice of calm meditation to the level of jhana, which is absorption, deep absorption. We're not so focused on where we feel the body, where we feel the breath. So although we might know where we're feeling it, we don't give that importance. We're just aware of breath in and of itself. And I don't know how many people here have practiced breath meditation to any depth. But this is a really critical distinction, whether you want to take breath meditation more into insight practice first, <laughs> or whether you want to develop deeper calm. So for the calm, we're more, um, we're emphasizing the bare occurrence of the breath, the fact that it's coming in or it's going out. Of course, you'll feel that as a sensation, but the main thing you want to be aware of is just the bare occurrence of the breath. 
so it's a subtle point but it's uh, something that you might like to play with again it's perception it's just the aspect that you emphasize to yourself so then the Buddha says when the in breath and out breath are long you are aware that they are long when the in breath and out breath are short you are aware that they are short I'm not sure that's the right place yeah this is better okay so the in breath and out breath are long you're aware that they're long when the in breath and out breath are short you're aware that they are short so these are the first two stages and it doesn't mean you have to have a long breath or a short breath but it's just describing the breath in a way that can maybe bring a bit more interest to the practice and it also accomplishes the first uh, jhana factor of vitaka. So we talked yesterday about the metta phrases being the vitaka in the metta practice, the initial attention to the meditation object. Here, just putting the mind on the breath or the breath coming into the mind and having that um, contact together is the vitaka. So it's the attention of the mind to the breath. And then in the next uh, stage, if you like, you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. So when we're able to sustain our mind on the breath, the whole breath, it's different from just knowing whether the breath is coming in or out. Because when you're only aware of whether it's in or out, there's still a lot of space for the mind to wander from the breath. So bit by bit, we learn to experience the, the whole length of the breath as it comes in and as it goes out. So the mind starts really resting on that and becoming closer to the breath, if you like. It's almost as though you can kind of start gliding or surfing the breath. So this increases the continuity and this is like the vichara, the sustained attention. Some teachers teach that that stage means feeling the whole body, but in the sutta itself, it actually says feeling the body of the breath. So at this point, we're simplifying our perception just to stay on that small area of experience. And in uh, Burma, where I ordained, my teacher used to say, you notice the beginning, the middle and the end of the breath, asa ale aso in Burmese. And that was really helpful because it just starts to bring more moments of mindfulness into the one breath. So the aim is to start being one with the breath, sort of gliding or surfing with the breath feeling that rhythm. And then the next thing that happens is you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and breathe out. Pasambayam kaya sankara, which means calming the whole breath. And it's important to notice at this point that we don't do the calming. The breath naturally calms. When our mind calms down, then the object of the mind calms down too. So if we go trying to make the breath calm then again it's not gentleness it's interfering it's control so this is just something that happens naturally the more we stay present to the breath we find that the body becomes tranquil the mind becomes tranquil and we actually don't need as much breath so the body the breath just starts to become more and more subtle more and more calm and then he says uh, on those occasions you are mindful of the body so in other words, this completes body meditation. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. In and out breathing is regarded by the Buddha as a body in the category of bodies. So like the body of water or the body of evidence. Here we have the body of the breath. That is why on that occasion, a meditator abides mindful of the body having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So these are the, the first kind of stages of breath meditation. And then we go to the second um, tetrad. So these are in four parts. And the next one is about the feeling tone of the breath, Vedana. So again, another of the four Satipatthanas. And it's interesting to note that the only feelings the Buddha talks about here are the pleasant feelings. <laughs> uh, 
So it's really interesting to uh, realize that this path of Buddhism is supposed to be a happy path. Uh, it's not that we push away the unhappiness, but we're trying to incline towards ever-increasing joy and get a taste for that joy, because it's quite different from worldly happiness. It actually comes as a result of putting so much complexity down. So here he says, when you learn to experience joy, piti, as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience pleasure, sukha, as you breathe in and out, when you learn to experience the mental formation of piti sukha, it just means the, the happiness itself as you breathe in and out. And when you learn to calm the happiness and pleasure, or if you like, the rapture and contentment as you breathe in and out, on those occasions you're mindful of experience, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. For being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation is being mindful of experience or feeling, vedana. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides mindful of experience or feeling, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. So this is interesting. It's a special kind of happiness that arises along with or in conjunction with the breath. So you might find that happiness sort of pervading the body and that's perfectly fine. But again, we don't give emphasis to that or deliberately spread it around if we want to develop this deep samadhi. But my teacher Ajahn Brahm had a nice phrase for me because I tend to feel the whole body a lot of the time. And he said, uh, park the joy or park the piti on the breath. So kind of keep the breath in mind and the joy is there in the background, but you really learn to associate it with the breath itself, which it has arisen due to. It has actually arisen due to simplifying the mind and becoming more and more peaceful. So if you do start spreading it around and moving your awareness, then in a way you're losing the cause for that PT and it may quickly dissipate. But we want to kind of keep on simplifying the mind and keeping it still at this stage. Yeah? And with that stillness, you'll find that the piti, the joy, can grow and grow. So, as I said, the nature of this piti sukha, this uh, happiness and joy that arises, is quite different from sensual happiness. It's actually more to do with moving into the mind and away from the body. Yeah? So it's, it's a certain sense of peace and happiness that arises from inside. And the Buddha calls that um, niramisha happiness, which means a wholesome kind of bliss. And uh, sometimes it's been helpful for me to just recognize happiness as a different kind of frequency in the mind. Because sometimes our minds are looking for something similar to the happiness that we experience when the senses are stimulated. Maybe when you're having a pleasant conversation or a cup of coffee or chocolate, you know, that's a kind of rapture, a kind of joy. But this is something much subtler and I remember once I was practicing in Perth during a long retreat and I realized my mind was quite calm, but I also realized that I wasn't experiencing any joy that I could really notice. And I just looked a little bit closer and waited with that feeling and kind of very soon started to sense a joy sort of behind the peace. <laughs> it's hard to put these things in words, but it felt like tuning into a different radio frequency that was there all the time, but that I just missed. And sometimes that's because we're looking for something else or we're looking somewhere else and we just haven't attuned to the happiness that's already there. And this happiness can be as kind of simple as an absence of suffering, right? I mean, peace is actually happiness, but when the mind is, is kind of coarse, it's looking for excitement we don't notice the happiness of peace. But after a while we get tuned up to that and we can start to experience peace as a kind of freedom, a kind of release. And then it's amazing how it can suddenly grow. So in this particular case, it filled up the whole body-mind very quickly and it was extraordinary really to experience how quickly that change of perception produced so much joy. 
and I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> I simply stopped getting in the way. I think that was the point. <laughs> it was there all the time, but I just didn't see it. And suddenly it pervaded the mind. So at this stage of meditation, sometimes people ask the question, okay, so happiness is important in breath meditation. Happiness helps the mind to stay with the breath, of course. But what do I do if there's no happiness? What do I do if there's no joy? Do I just keep going and trying harder? Or, you know, do I give up? What happens when boredom comes in, frustration comes in, etc. And uh, I was thinking about this because it's a common uh, thing at this stage. And I think the main point is we don't do any of these stages. They are really something that happen very naturally. Um, and yet there are things you can, <coughs> it's hard to use a word that's not like do. There's a way to encourage that PT, that happiness as well in the mind. And of course, one of those things is the metta, the loving kindness that we've been practicing already. Another one of those things is to reflect on our own goodness, the qualities that we experience in ourselves. And they're there. <laughs> It's just something about our culture almost makes it a bit taboo to look. <laughs> but this was one of the Buddha's very important meditation methods. It was called Chaganusati, which means recollection of one's own generosity, one's own goodness. And it's not for the sake of bolstering the sense of self. It's actually just to notice that if I perform acts of generosity, if I give somebody a delicious meal, I feel good about that. There's a joy to that giving that it's so easy to overlook. And if we reflect on that, we might remember, yeah, I did feel good. I did feel, you know, that I'd overcome a sense of, I don't know, busyness or maybe stinginess or really wanting to do something for myself. You know, I gave something up, I did something for another and that caused happiness for them. So these are ways that we can use our mind in everyday life. And, you know, one of the difficulties here is we don't have enough joy in our lives. So sometimes we actually have to kind of take a really honest look at our lives and the way we're um, living in daily life to find out the reasons why this happiness doesn't arise in breath meditation. So the Buddha said, you know, that happiness is basically the whole of the path. And the happiness starts right where we are. We don't have to wait for something special in the future, but we can start to cultivate it right from the beginning with things like virtue and really going out of our way to help others, for example. And he called that a kind of blameless bliss. Again, a kind of absence, if you like, right? But freedom from remorse, from resentment, from wrongdoing, you know, and the guilt that goes with that is actually a kind of happiness. There's a lightness, there's a freedom to the mind. And then as we continue to progress with the gradual training that's taught in the suttas many, many times, we learn to use our mind in skillful ways in our daily life. So the example I usually like to use is just focusing on people's goodness rather than their faults, focusing on the things that you know we appreciate about the day rather than the things that went wrong. You know, nowadays there's research, scientific research, on the effects of things like keeping gratitude journals. And if you do that for, I think, between one and three months, if you do that every day just with three or four points, concrete examples of things that you're grateful for, it actually changes the brain. It changes the kind of neural wiring, if you like, and those channels for happiness get wider. <laughs> this is not a very scientific way to explain it, but you know, it's creating those neural connections and it becomes like a pattern, a habit in the mind. So you're creating a deeper groove, the groove of contentment, gratitude, joy, by using your mind in these ways. So, and then from there, the Buddha says we can get something called unblemished or unsullied happiness. So it's the happiness of actually drawing the senses in rather than seeking our happiness through sight, sound, smells, taste and touch, but starting to experience happiness inside the mind. You know, so when you sit down to meditate, for example, you can sit down and just notice the joy of silence. 
<laughs> it's just something peaceful and something happy about that, right? There's something really beautiful if we care to look. So this is what happens when the senses start to withdraw and the happiness comes from outside. And then, of course, mindfulness itself is happy because the lights of the mind are shining. You know, they're turning up. We're starting to see more of life. We're able to see like beauty in just a little old leaf. Or I used to laugh at people who did that. I used to think you had to go in the Himalayas and see like fantastic things. And, but nowadays, maybe I don't have any Himalayas nearby. <laughs> but nowadays I can just look at a stone on the ground or I can look at recently in London, I saw um, some autumn leaves that had fallen and they'd blown away from that spot, but they'd left like wet imprints on the pavement. And it was just really pretty to see. And it's the kind of thing that's there all the time, but if you're in a hurry, you just go right past. You don't see those kind of subtle beauties that are there in everyday life, especially when it's grey, right? Sometimes I try and look in the sky, oh, so many kinds of grey. <laughs> this kind of dark grey and mucky grey. And <laughs> but even there, there can be beauty to be found. So with the mindfulness increasing, we can see more of life. We can see more of ourselves and one another and start to find happiness there as well. And of course that increases when we come into the happiness of meditation and the happiness of deep states of samadhi. And of course with that uh, samadhi, if we can start to undermine some of those you know, negative or afflictive patterns of the mind, there's a great release. There's a great happiness that arises when we let go of, say, a clinging or an unwholesome habit or we let go of resentment, you know, we free ourselves from others' mistakes and our own mistakes of the past, you know, or we find we're becoming more compassionate and less judgmental towards others because through understanding, right, that we're all conditioned by our past, you know, we couldn't really be any other way and I might have been just like someone else if I'd had their background. In fact, I can't really see that I'd be any different at all, you know. And, and extending that to oneself, one's own faults as well. Because we're so hard on our own faults. You know, they get so exaggerated and inflated in our minds. <laughs> but it's usually not the way most people see us at all. So we start to question our perceptions and our reality by learning to mould perception in skillful ways. We see that there's really no absolutely correct way of looking at things, but in the same way, the more we can overcome these hindrances, the more reliable our perceptions will be. Because if you're looking at life through the lens of craving, you're going to see what you want to see, you know, what you, be you really want to believe about something or someone. You know, you really want this person to be the perfect person who's going to change your life forever. And you're blind to their faults. And then when you get a divorce or when something goes wrong and they start arguing or you start having conflicts, then they're terrible and you don't know what you saw in them at all. <laughs> so really, neither was real. It was just the way our mind was bent, our perception was distorted through our cravings and then our ill will when our desires were not met. So really, there's no quick answer. For, for these things, but it's an entire path. And that path has to, you know, start transforming the mind through the way we live our lives, as well as the way we practice on the cushion. And the two will obviously interrelate enormously. You know, I've noticed for myself the difference, for example, with being around good company, whole, wholesome, wise friends, compared to being around people that I'm not quite at ease with or there's something there that my instinct says I can't trust. There's a huge difference in my state of well-being and, and ease. And, you know, that's one of the reasons the Buddha said that wise friendship's the whole of the path, because it really does matter who we associate with. And, of course, how we regard those people as well. That will bring out their best or not, depending how we look at those people. So we have to transform our mind and it takes time. But uh, one very encouraging piece of advice that my teacher uh, said to me during my six month retreat was that um, it doesn't matter how long it takes. And sometimes trees that grow very fast don't last. For example, 
trees that grow in the desert, their roots don't go very deep, so they grow very fast. I'm not sure if this is actually botanically true or not, but they grow very fast. And then if a wind comes or a storm, they fall down. Whereas trees that grow in rocky mountains and have to really dig their roots around the rocks, around the other trees' roots as well, they take longer to grow, they're slower. But when they get there, they last longer. And I really like this because it really indicates to me that it's not anything you can measure, first of all, and it's not uh, up to us, but also that it's about all the causes and conditions coming together. You have to go through the whole Eightfold Path. So deep meditation is the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path. The path is not a one-fold path. It's not just right mindfulness. It's not just right samadhi. It's not just even right thought or intention, but it's all eight factors working in harmony and working together to mutually reinforce themselves. And when samadhi does come, not only as part of the path, but as the eighth factor in its proper sequence, you know, supported by right view, a real appreciation of suffering and this response of compassion to the suffering nature in the world, the suffering in the world and of ourselves. And when it comes, you know, reinforced by the understanding of non-self. So there's a humility there. We don't experience these deep meditations and think, I'm so great, I'm better than other people that didn't get them, you know. But there's this sense that this is just cause and effect. And when, you know, it's infused with that right intention and there's these beautiful qualities in the heart, our sila, our virtue is very strong. Then when we do enter into these deep states of samadhi, they will have the foundation to last. You know, it's almost like, you could also think of it like buildings, right? If you build a big skyscraper with a small little foundation, it goes straight up to the sky, but it's not that strong. Whereas if you build a pyramid, it takes ages. I can't imagine how they did it in ancient Egypt, but it goes really so wide. <laughs> but then not only is the building on top much stronger, and it's almost impossible to topple over. You can build it much higher as well because the foundation is so wide and so deep and so strong. So I guess the main point is don't worry if these things are not arising, but make sure you're looking in the right place. You're, you're looking in this present moment and developing contentment there because really happiness can only be where we are right now. And if we're not content with this, contentment isn't going to come later on. <laughs> so let's do some meditation on the breath. And as usual, this is just an invitation. <laughs> if you feel like you want to continue practicing the metta meditation or kindfulness, whatever your heart inclines, please do. And uh, if the breath comes up and your mind feels drawn to that breath, then you can try a little bit of that as well. So most of you are familiar with the practices, so I'll just say a few words to encourage wholesome states and then give some basic instructions for the breath and let you have your journey. So we'll sit for 
What do you think? 40 minutes? Is that good? Yeah. And you can continue afterwards if you wish. So with your eyes closed, just appreciating the simplification of the mind, the eyes no longer impinged upon by objects of sight. quiet in the room. The sense of being present to your body, fully inhabiting the here and now. Whatever happened a moment ago, just setting that aside. Whatever you expect to happen, you're recognizing you can never really know. What you can know of and be sure of is this present moment. The sense of your body sitting feeling of the legs or the feet on the ground. The position of your hands, your shoulders, your back, and your head balanced effortlessly on the top of your spine. Really inviting yourself into this space, the shared space infused with friendship, with minds that incline to goodness, to truth. And noticing if that brings a sense of happiness, ease, allowing the body to more deeply relax. Perhaps recollecting something in your life that you're really grateful for. Perhaps it could be the gift of this retreat, 
this opportunity for stillness and peace. A special person in your life or a pet. A charity that you're involved with, whatever it is, something that brings you joy and a sense of gratitude. Perhaps you're remembering the loved person that you were practicing metta toward. And if you wish, you can spread metta once again to that person. Using directed thought, if that helps, and noticing the happiness of kind ways of thinking, listening to the resonance of those thoughts in the mind, in the heart. And staying with these wholesome perceptions, these practices of loving kindness, gratitude, joy, for as long as you feel that that's nourishing for you. So that by doing so, you're establishing mindfulness, the right kind of mindfulness with kindness co-joined at the beginning of your meditation.
And at any point in the meditation, when you feel your mind inclining to stillness, to simplicity, to peace, and see if the breath wants to enter your mind. Invite the breath in. Maintaining the same friendly disposition toward your breath as you would toward the beloved friend. So allowing the mood of metta to infuse the breath as though the breath were a very timid little bird that required the most delicate of handling. Just enough to give it a feeling of security and protection, but not so tight as to crush that little bird. So treating your breath as a very delicate, refined little being who's come to your mind to say hello. Simply noticing the occurrence of the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. Staying present to the whole of the breath. Allowing the breath to hold the mind. And if you find the breath is too subtle to notice, then that's no problem at all. Just continue cultivating metta, loving kindness, until the breath may naturally come to your mind. Doesn't matter either way. Just staying content with whatever arises in this present moment. Treating everything as a friend.
Whether you're practicing with loving kindness or whether you have the breath in mind, see if you can tune in to the subtle happiness or peace or joy in that breath or in the mind. In loving kindness, it can often be located around the heart area or the body as a whole. In breath meditation, see if you can experience that joy associated with the breath. just the same joy, very similar in nature. Experienced by the mind. The joy of contentment. The bliss of peace.
We're coming close to the end of the meditation. Although you may continue if you wish in the sitting posture. Just notice any peace, any joy, ease in the heart. as a result of this meditation. How does it feel? So just imbibing that happiness, that peace. And seeing if you can stay connected to whatever peace has developed in your mind as we end the meditation. Then move into the walking meditation. Keeping the mind inside. Maintaining continuity. And guarding that happiness, that peace, as though it were a very, very cherished and precious friend to the mind. So for those on Zoom who can't hear the bell, you may take a few more breaths and then open your eyes and here I'll ring the gong so people can listen to the sound of the gong and gently emerge from your meditation, staying connected to that peace inside the mind. So now is the optional walking meditation. Whether you wish to continue in this hall or engage with the walking, see if you can contain and continue with the continuity. Because sometimes when a little bit of peace and joy arises, even if we think it's nothing much, we can just let it go too easily. We don't really value that peace. So see if you can go about your next activity, especially the transition from sitting to standing to walking, keeping connected to the peace in the mind. 